And we are live. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Felipe from the Instantly team. We have here the great AJ Quesada, an active community member in the call email masterclass by Instantly. Also a dear partner of ours and a call email expert with more than 10 years of experience and more than 400 agency owners and clients that he has helped. I think it's 400, maybe it's more, I don't know, AJ. Like 400 something, yeah. We, we, just, we just count when it hits 100 basically, but yeah. <laughs> uh, nice, love it, love it. Yeah, so today basically we'll be discussing a few things. So we'll be asking AJ about his success story, maybe like a few tips that he can give you guys. We'll be answering your questions live. So please feel free to ask your questions. Uh, in the comment section below, we are live streaming on YouTube, Facebook, and also LinkedIn. So we'll be reading all of your questions in all of those platforms. Um, so AJ, how, why don't we just kick it out like with uh, maybe like a quick intro about yourself? Like, um, so you have 10 years of experience, 400 um, agents and 400 agencies that you have helped. Like, what are some of those uh, big wins that you are proud of? Like, is there like any success story that you want to share with people out there? Yeah, for sure. First, thanks for having me. Um, I remember being on your guys' channel about a year ago, uh, talking to Nils, and that was a that was a really fun one too. So it's it's great to come back, and I love what you guys are are doing. I know that also, um, yeah, like there's there's a lot of cold email tools popping up, but like you guys are just like my favorite. Not only do I use you guys all the time, but I recommend you to all of our clients, all of our coaching clients, and I love how you guys just constantly make new features and like listen to the community. So first, great job to you and the rest of the team for that. Um, so now to talk more about myself and some of my wins. Yeah, I've been in the space for uh, 10 years, even though I don't look that old. I dropped out of college when I was 18. I got into sales doing door to door. So I really got into this like out, like I didn't do cold email 10 years ago, but I got into outbound lead gen, right? And I did it the worst way doing like big construction company, knocking on doors. I've knocked on like probably tens of thousands of doors back then when I was in college. Cause I was like, cool. Like somebody will hire me to do sales. Right. And, uh, that taught me a lot though, because I ended up uh, dropping out of school to work full time. And then I built this, uh, this sales team of like 20 people. So I was 23 years old managing this whole team and like learning so much about business, sales, scaling, lead gen, marketing. Uh, and it was really amazing. But of course, like many entrepreneurs, you know, I eventually realized like I want to do this on my own. If I already know how to like get lead, once you know how to get leads, make offers, sell and deliver and manage like some of the basic business operations, like you can do anything, right? You can do any kind of company, right? Any service-based business. So left construction, got into digital marketing. My first thing was an agency. Um, it didn't go as well as I planned at first. I remember after I left my corporate job, I thought I was ready to like crush it because I just was like all the way up here selling, selling, selling. Uh, but then I, you know, really crashed and burned. Uh, I was doing too many things in my agency, too many different products, too many different services, too many different niches. At one point, I was actually living in a in a car, like literally like living in Arizona, living in a van with my ex girlfriend and ex business partner. It was a whole crazy story. Um, it's funny because you asked me about my wins, and now I'm talking about like like the lowest part, but it it relates to it, right? So. Yeah, yeah. I, I came from like the absolute yeah bottom and I realized like, okay, this is not working. Uh, I'm not getting clients. What am I doing? That's when I found cold email, hammered cold email, hammered like uh, even calling some of these businesses. Eventually we got our first, we went from like zero to like 15K a month in a few months. And I was like, okay, cool. This is great. Uh, scaled it further. Uh, then I got into performance marketing doing like uh, paid lead gen where they just pay us for results. Uh, that was really great. We got to work with some of the biggest companies in business finance and solar. By the way, business finance, a great niche for cold email for anyone who has an agency doing cold email. Um, all that to say, uh, scaled an agency. Um, and then I started Revenue Boost two years ago, which was really coaching based on how I found and, and closed clients for my agency. Because what I realized is a lot of people, they start a business, freelance, consulting, agency, they start a service business and they don't know how to get clients, right? And even if they know how to get leads, they don't really know how to sell, how to follow up, how to upsell. So this whole like sales process was really, really second nature to me because I've been doing it for like a, like almost a, like over a decade now. I realized other people needed that help, right? So I started Revenue Boost and it just absolutely took off, right? We went from zero to 50,000 a month within like four months. And we that was no ad spend. That was just organic and that was just cold email. Um, and we just started a new business, got, got to like 50, that 50K a month mark really quick. Then I realized wow. that had something really good and I just went all into it. And we've built, we've now served 76 clients in our coaching and done with you program. Our model is like, we don't just generate release for you. We'll come in, we'll help you learn cold email, we'll help you learn LinkedIn, we'll help you learn how to sell, we'll help you optimize your offer, your niche, your messaging, your positioning. So really like scaling the whole business. And yeah, it's been a blast. I think one of my big, my favorite wins uh, was I got invited by Founder. Um, Founder is a brand I followed for years. They flew yep. me out to Australia to teach a course on Outbound Lead Gen. Um, and that was a really cool moment because it was a brand I looked up to forever. And to be invited to like fly out to them, everything paid for and like teach, it was just really 
really humbling. So of course there's like the revenue milestones and all that stuff, but I think it's cool to look for these other wins that are like affirmations that what you're doing is, is working, right? So anyways, now we have a team of 10. Um, it's, it's a little bit more compli complicated when, than when it was just me sending cold emails, but uh, it's it's been fun, man. I don't know if that answered the question, but that's kind of the quick synopsis of, of my journey and how I went from basically living in a car, like hating life to here. Love <laughs> it. Love it. Those are the kind of success stories that we love right here. Like, you know, how people go, go from like, like just sweat and tears and, you know, like the struggle. In fact, I'm seeing like a comment right now here from Craig saying that um, he was doing the same thing. He was also living in a car, but by choice. So I guess like, you know, he was probably like trying to, um, you know, put a lot of pressure on himself and maybe like try to cut like a lot of costs just to like achieve big dreams. But yeah, he's yeah. coming is here. Like he loves how you focus on one thing now. And, you know, you take, you basically took all of those experiences as a learning lesson to where you are today. But yeah, I love oh, it. So let's start. Absolutely. Let, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. So yeah, how about if we start with something like controversial, you know, like just to get like people like, um, you sure. know, talking about like what, what basically what everyone is talking about right now. Let's talk about Google. Let's talk about like these restrictions, you know, like, like, um, you know, I've been doing call email also for 10 years and every single year I hear call email is dead. I swear to you, at least two or three oh, times yeah, a year too. I hear yeah. it. So like, let's talk about that. What are your thoughts on it? Okay. Anyone that says cold email is dead, I'm going to ask you something. And this is, by the way, if you're selling cold email as a service and you and you sell the clients who, whoa, whatever the method is, if you sell Facebook ads, cold email, whatever, and your clients like, does this work? All you got to say is this and everyone listening. And let me ask you, have you opened up an email in the last week? Have you checked into Gmail for anything? Everyone here has probably opened up their email inbox in the last day, in the last few hours, in the last week. Everybody on the world, except for like maybe really, really old people, uh, have, has an email address, right? So the way that I look at any marketing, so by the way, even though I'm very big on cold email and outbound, we do ads, we do organic for ourselves. Like people see me like on podcasts and stuff a lot. We have a podcast too. Um, and like the way I look at any marketing channel is that they're just, it's just a way to deliver a message. If you realize that any marketing channel is a way to get a message to somebody, whether it's door to door, telemarketing, events, podcasts, cold email, LinkedIn, it's just a way to get your message. So if it didn't work, it's because your message sucked or your offer sucked or the client wasn't the right client. So whenever anyone says like, does cold email work? It's like, well, let's go back to the first principles, right? A marketing channel just has to deliver your message to the target market. Then it's up to you to sell them, right? Everyone in the world has, a, has an email, right? Not everyone has a Facebook. Not everyone has a TikTok. Not everyone has an Instagram. Not everyone has whatever the new thing is that's probably going to come out next year. There's always something new, right? But yeah. why, I love, why I'm so passionate about cold email is because everybody on earth has one, right? Yeah. And it's free to reach them. Yes, use instantly because it, it saves you time and money. But even, either, even without that, it's free to send an email. So yeah. yes, cold email works because people still check their email inbox. That's the, that's the way you should judge a marketing channel is like, does it work and is it cost efficient, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I agree with works. you. I think I think the only case scenario that I haven't seen cold email working, and because I haven't seen someone trying it, is trying to get a girlfriend or a boyfriend. But I've seen it like for getting a job, like getting a new client, like partnerships. Like myself, for example, I do it for partnerships, and I have like a great reply rate. But that's amazing. You know, it's, yeah, it's, like you can like you can do it for whatever you want. But yeah, so, so mm -hmm. go on. Oh, just quick thing. Uh, now we know. Okay, there's only one use that Felipe saying we're not sure if it works for cold email getting a girlfriend or boyfriend somebody try it and post it in the group because that would be so <laughs> awesome right yeah that would be awesome would be, hey I think that would work because the person would be like wow no one's ever emailed me like this so now it's like <laughs> you're standing out right so might as well try it yeah. but yeah it works for everything um I know you did another question but just to say one real one quick one quick thing every every marketing channel works guys what doesn't work is changing your strategy every three months you will be in a cycle of like struggle forever if you keep changing and pivoting every three or six or 12 months, you got to just pick one thing and just do it because they all work. There's always a question about like what works better and what's going to work better for my niche. It's all about like, is your target market there? And does this channel like, does it work for you? Did, like, do you, like, can you kind of, can you understand it? Right. Um, but yeah, they all work. And I think what's the biggest, we can talk about more later in the, in the interview, but the biggest thing that helped me the most in my entrepreneurial career is focus. It's not getting on LinkedIn. It's not like, not anything else. It's just focus, right? Because everything is possible. It's just, you have to know what do you want to do and then just do that like repeatedly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree with you. So let's get a bit more technical. So basically Google say that, you know, basically like let's talk about data. So they say 5,000 emails per workspace. That's the limit and 0 0.3, um, spam rate. That should be like, like your basically your rates. So now from what we know of, uh, AWS, you know, Amazon and their email provider, they actually, if you send newsletter via them, they they apply a 0 0.1 uh, 
uh, spam reply rate, meaning that they are they are three times more strict or like mathematically, I don't know like how you want to calculate yeah. it, but basically they are way more strict than Google and they have been on the market for way longer. And I know a lot of people that send newsletter emails via, the, via Amazon SES. And then, um, well, I, th I feel like everyone who does call email on scale like they have different workspaces and, you know, I think that like different inboxes, different domains. So that should be like a norm today. So yeah. basically, I think the message we want to send out there for people is that, you know, it's it's great times now to educate yourself and those who are experienced and have, you know, have done the due diligence to study this stuff and have different um, domains, different inboxes. They use inbox rotation. They work on their copy. Their offer, like you were saying, they target the, the right niche with the right offer. Like they're going to do yeah. great. Like, but I, I would be afraid if I was like sending like, you know, emails offering very spammy stuff, you know, and with a single domain, then I, I would be probably worried, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah, me too. No, it's a great point. I think, um, yes, Gmail came out with a new update. And yes, like guys, these platforms are used, Gmail, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever you use, it's going to keep changing. It's going to keep like things are going to get harder, right? Um, it's just about doing it properly and knowing the best practices, right? So I wouldn't freak. I, yeah, I'm not freaking out about the Gmail update. I'm sure you guys aren't either. And honestly, like I think, um, yeah, as long as you follow the best practices and use the right tools, like you'll be fine. It just it means you have to be better. Which honestly, I, I have a kind of a controversial or like different view on this. But with whenever something gets harder, that's an opportunity to be better, right? Because if everybody in the world could send five thousand cold emails, everyone would do it, and it'd be really hard yeah. to break through. So if cold email gets harder, less and less people do it, which means if you can just be better, it's going it, to, this happens with everything. But iOS 14, or uh, I think it was four or five years ago, right? Everything changed with Facebook and Facebook ads became way harder overnight, right? Because they stopped allowing you to track so much, right? And then what happened? Like a lot of pretty crappy marketers, you know, were out of luck, but they were crappy marketers to begin with. They just, they just now got exposed, right? So anytime, and it happened with LinkedIn too. LinkedIn about a year, what, two years ago? Uh, they made the restrictions higher. You used to be able to DM tons of people. Now you can't. It's much harder, right? But I like to, I always like to, I'm just an optimist, I guess. Sometimes it gets me into trouble. Like it's not being too optimistic isn't good, but it's, yeah. um, but I just always try to look at the good in the situation. And, and if things get harder, that means that you got to get better. And it's like, yeah. it's evolution, right? Only the strongest survive. So you should be excited if Gmail makes things harder. It's going to be a pain in the butt, but it means that other less people are going to do it. And if you do it well, you can get paid more by your clients and you can stand out more, you know? Yeah, absolutely. 100% agree with you. And, and actually, I feel like, you know, now when I send a message on LinkedIn, that it's not like the standard of like, hey, I saw your profile. But if you actually add value on a message there on LinkedIn or even yeah. on, on an email, uh, I feel like you stand out way more than before. And it's all like thanks to those restrictions in a way, because I feel like like people, like, if you don't innovate, I guess, like every two years or every year, probably like you're going to be, you know, left behind. So it's it's. Yeah. Yeah. Totally, man. Totally. That's a great, really great point. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. So, so, um, how about uh, niches and offers? So, you guys, just so you know, AG, uh, he's amazing at helping you guys with all your, all of your niches and offers. Like, I've seen him, you know, helping other community members and also other clients with, you know, finding the right niches because I feel like a lot of people like they really struggle finding that. So, how about like you give like the community out there like some tips when it comes to you know finding the right niche with the right offer because i feel like that's very essential like for conversions yeah. like a, a lot of people they try to sell eyes to the schemas and that yeah just, or yeah. meat meat to a vegan that's my favorite analogy. Me, <laughs> yeah or meat to a vegan yeah that's even worse i guess <laughs> <laughs> that's an ethical issue yeah but uh yeah no re i'm really glad you asked that question because um i think this is something everyone listening needs to hear even if you know your niche in your offer you can get deeper you can get more niche and you can enhance your offer a lot more so I think this is a really bigger conversation about how if you just rely on tactics like a new copy template or a new software tool or whatever, these things help you, but they don't make or break your business. You have to know what really builds a business. It's your niche, it's your offer, it's your positioning in the market, like your messaging, right? Which is where your copy comes from. These things make or break your business and your sales process, right? Because if you don't have these things right, you could be the best cold email in the world. Like you're not, if you're selling ice to the Eskimo, it's not going to work, right? So um, I found this kind of by accident because like, yeah, so on my agency journey, when I finally focused on one niche and one offer, everything became a lot easier because here's the thing. So uh, I was on Digital Marketers podcast recently, which is another really cool moment. I love Digital Marketer. They're a great brand. And the president of it told me that like every agency in their community has the same thing. They're all super smart, really smart marketers, but they can't niche down. And he's like, one guy even told me that he has 10 niches. And it's like, that's not how the word works. 10 niches doesn't, that's not how that goes against the meaning of the word, right? Yeah. So 
when you have a lot of different niches, a lot of different services, or one of the two, you're slowing down your progress in all of them. So let's say that you have five different types of clients, right? And let's say you have like a few different services, right? Imagine that you have like a, just imagine a circle, right? It'd be cool if I had a whiteboard, but imagine you had a circle, right? And each thing you do cuts into a little like pot, like piece of the circle, right? Um, each little thing just kind of cuts another piece. It's like a pizza pie, right? Every niche, every offer is like one slice you're taking out, right? Um, but what if you just have like the pie that's just one massive slice, you'll have more energy to it, right? Another way you can think about it is this. Let's say I, let's say you have a hundred, uh, whatever, 40, 80, 160 hours in a month, right? At a, you only have a certain amount of hours and like units of time in a month, right? So if you have your focus split in all these different directions, you're giving a little bit of time to each and you're going to be very mediocre at all these things. Maybe he's really good at some of them, but if you can just get that circle of focus to be on one thing and, and your time units to be focused on one thing, you can have, you know, 40 hours a week, 160 hours a month, focus completely on being the best at it. And because if you're not, your competition is, right? If you're all over the place in your business, you have different services, different niches, your competition that's like, hey, I'm the cold email guy for SaaS companies, he's going to crush you because every client is going to choose him because they feel more confident that he's a specialist, right? Again, we probably already know, like everyone listening, you guys probably already know that niche now is important. I think it's really hard to know how to do it. So we can talk about that. I have a little bit of a formula, but assuming that you know you need to niche down further and that's going to benefit you, assuming that you know you need to create a better offer. And by the way, guys, an offer is not just we get you 100 appointments or you don't pay. Like, yes, Alex Tremosi <laughs> talks about these crazy guarantees and they're cool, but that's not really what an offer is, right? And he talks about it in his book too. Guarantees is like one chapter. So when I say offer, I don't just mean cool guarantee, bold claim. In fact, you guys, if you made a more realistic claim, you might even get more clients because I posted on my Facebook the other day uh, about how like, if you have a less crazy claim, people will believe you more. And I totally yeah. believe this. So the market's getting more skeptical. If, if I tell you, Felipe, I'm going to get you 200 appointments in a, in a month, you might you might be like, first, I don't want that many. That sounds stressful. <laughs> Second, it's like, I don't believe you. That sounds like BS. But if I'm like, hey, Felipe, I can get you five appointments a week. You'll be like, you know what? That sounds re like, I trust this guy. That sounds like a very honest calculated number, right? So first of all, remember that your offer doesn't need to be this crazy big thing. Um, anyway, I can talk about like some steps on how to define your niche and offer, but I'll stop there because that was a lot. And if you have any follow-up questions. Yeah, no, of course. No, I agree with you on that one. And I feel like also that's part of like the discovery process with your niche or your industry. Like you can even like start maybe asking like, to people like openly, like how many, like how many additional meetings is your team needing in order to like reach your goal, your goal or your quota? I feel like, Absolutely, like, you yeah. know, you know, yeah. I feel like when, when people feel like they're being listened um and and being listened it's not like let's have a call you know because a lot of people feel like let's have a yeah. call but it's more like doing like those discovery questions in the email that that show that you did your due, due diligence um and, and they use sometimes even like the uh technical language that you're you're using in that in that specific niche so for example absolutely target, so I, I think that that, that definitely Re so. Really, really good point right because you know before when we when you introduced me and I was you were saying how I've worked with 400 agencies and consulting entrepreneurs, right? If I didn't have a niche, I would have all these different clients. And even if I had a lot of clients, it wouldn't be that impressive. But yeah. the fact that we like anytime someone hops on the call to help have us help them scale their agency, we, we always have a story of a client just like them, right? We have case studies relevant to them. And that's what makes your sales process really good. But also one thing you pointed out that I think was really great is customer language and research, right? So yeah. if I'm writing an ad or an email or whatever, or a post, I know my market so well, I know what to talk about you lose that ability when you don't really have a very clear, defined, focused uh, business strategy, right? You know, you lose that. And that's the gems, right? Like um, that's, that's what really makes great marketing. And this is back to, I'm a huge believer in foundations and principles over tactics. I think everyone's looking for the shortcut. There's no, and we talked about earlier, people that just try something for three months and then quit. It's because they're looking for shortcuts. There is no shortcut. And you guys have all heard, yeah. you know, Hermosi say this. I know he was on the show recently, which is super awesome, by the way. Yeah. Hermosi always says this, like, just do the boring work, stop looking for shortcuts, right? Because if you just do one thing, you keep getting the nuance, you keep getting better at it, right? But if you keep looking for shortcuts, you don't really, if you keep looking for shortcuts and tactics, you, you're missing the point. It's not about shortcuts. It's about principles of business, principles of marketing, principles of psychology, which is like getting to know your audience, right? So yeah, that, this is what it's all about. I, I will say this to like, I'm dead pretty much. Like you have to know these principles and the foundations of your business, not look for that, not think that the next the next software tool that you're going to buy on Black Friday is going to change your life. I'm sorry, guys, it's not. Have fun Black Friday shopping. Do it. Yeah. I'll do it too. But like, just realize that's not what's going to make or break your business. You know? Yeah. By the way, speaking of Black Friday, I mean, I cannot give more details about it, but we're actually launching a Black Friday deal. Uh, oh, sweet! To, I have to know, check it out. 
yeah, you have to check it out actually because you're obviously an instantly user. But um, yeah, we're giving like a very decent discount. So yeah, I think I think like a few people out there will be happy. You know, we just want to like hump it in the car and, and you know make people motivated. So yeah, check your yeah, inboxes. Cool. You you might receive an email if you are um you know a user or part of our newsletter subscriber you'll get an email you'll hear about it but yeah you'll hear more about it later if not you can ask our support team like i think like tomorrow uh yeah you, you know when, yeah when don't miss out on that if you plan if you plan to use instantly by the way i make zero money by recommending this we're not using my affiliate link or anything i'm just saying like if you guys like are gonna use instantly the next year then just do it because it's like why wouldn't you save right um yeah. so i'm gonna hop on that for sure yeah, I appreciate that. So yeah, so when when it comes to niches and offers, and you know, um, validating a niche or an offer. So for example, um, yeah, definitely, like I completely agree with you when it comes to no shortcuts. Uh, but sometimes you want to validate like certain things between that niche and offer. Like for example, if you are targeting the right person, uh, like let's say let's say maybe like you're going for the CEOs in a specific niche and offer where actually they usually don't make the decisions or mm. um, maybe for a company size that is not the right one. So what is what is your recommendation when it comes to validating um, your process, your niche, your cycle? Um, yeah, like what, what are your thoughts about it? Yeah, that's a really good question. So getting more into like how to define your niche and offer. Yes, even though you want to commit to one thing for a while, it might take you some experimentation to get there. So this is why, where it comes down to stages of your business. And then you can use instantly to A-B test niches and offers. But that aside, there's stages, right? So I found a really good analogy is like the hourglass analogy. I learned this initially from Kazem Aslam, who founded like one of the biggest Google ads agency. Um, and basically, uh, just basically an hourglass is like, if you don't know what it is, it's one of those things that counts time and it's goes, starts broad at the top, gets more specific in the middle, then it expands out, right? Yeah. So I found this when I was working with agency owners, I found that some of them like knew what niche they wanted to go after and they just wanted to like refine that. Some of them, they're all over the place, right? So it should start broad. So let's say that you're not really sure what niche to go after or what job titles or like, let's say that you still have a lot of ideas. It's okay to have it be a little bit broad. Don't have to be too broad, but let's say you want to test five niches in the next year because you really don't know, right? Maybe see if you can get it down to three through like research and like, you know, like, you know, just understanding the market, right? But you want to, you don't always have to be picking one niche in the beginning. The goal, okay, so the goal is to get to one niche, but you don't always just decide that by snapping your fingers. You have to kind of test your way there, right? So the way, reason it's an hourglass is because you start broad, maybe you have a couple of niches that you've really thought through, then you test them as quick as you can, and then you get indicators on like who's closing more, who's more profitable, who's easier to sell. And then eventually you might find that one sweet spot this niche, this offer, this message, this problem, this is what they care about. And the reason that the hourglass comes out of the bottom is because once you know that one niche and offer, then you expand within that niche by upsells and maybe going to an adjacent market, right? Or, or other offers, right? So it's like, that's why, you know, it's really, this is why it's really complicated to grow a business is because it's all about doing the right thing at the right time, right? What you do at 100K a month is different than 5K a month, right? So like in the, if you're in the, in the early days, it's okay to experiment with niches. I did too. When I first started my agency, I experimented with a lot. And, that, and, and by trying different niches, it helped me realize like, okay, now who should I focus on, right? Um, so again, you start maybe a little bit broad, then you get more specific. And when you find that sweet spot, and we can talk about that, like then you just, you just go all in and then you expand out later. But you don't even need to expand with other offers and other upsells. But the point is, if you want to scale to like maybe seven, eight figures, you got to expand out. But to like get to 25K a month, 50K a month, 100K a month, you don't need more than just this one specific thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I completely agree with you on that one. Yeah, 100%. And, yeah. and so, so for example, like you have spoken with a lot of agencies and advised a lot of people. So for people out there, I guess this will be useful. So what are like those big mistakes when it comes to niches and offers that people are making today? Like those things that... You know, that you see all the time people repeating like the same mistakes uh, when it comes to niches and offers. Like, because I know, like, for example, some people, um, you know, like they, they might be persistent, but they are, they are still making like a few mistakes. So, uh, yeah, what do you think like will be like those mistakes that you're seeing all the time? Yeah. So I've seen, I have a good, yeah, view of the agency space because I've been just been talking, working with like so many, like, even though we've worked or taught our methods to over 400, we, I've spoken to like thousands. It's like, I can't even keep up. Um, <laughs> So I have a good kind of sense for like what's not working, what is, what, you know, how the market's changing. And I think the first mistake is people, they just don't niche down, right? They either do two opposites. They either don't niche down, right? They just think, you know what? I'm just going to keep, uh, it's working now. I'm getting clients. Let me just niche down later. Cause they don't know how to, or it's hard to make it. It's, it's like, a, it's like a marriage, right? 
it doesn't have to be like a big commitment, but like it feels like that, right? So people either, the biggest mistake is they just don't commit to niching down and getting a very clear client type and offer, right? Or on the other end of the spectrum, they're, they, they overthink it and they just pick this one niche. Like I'm going to work with SaaS companies out of uh, Dubai that have like 20K a month, like too specific, and they haven't really validated it, right? So again, you want to be somewhere in the middle and then you want to get to somewhere specific. So big mistake is either just not niching down and procrastinating it or just trying like overthink it. Again, you don't, which kind of leads to the third mistake, which is they don't, um, a lot of agencies, they think that the niche is in their head. You don't just kind of create your niche, you kind of discover your niche. So what, I, what do I mean by that? Creating a niche is like me sitting in my basement with you know my friends and just being like, what would be a cool niche to go after, right? That's like, you gotta do a little bit of that brainstorming, but again, you have to do market research and you have to test it. And that's why I love instantly for testing, right? You could send you know 5,000 emails to niche A, 5,000 emails to niche B, same copy, and if one of them converts better, okay, now you know we're onto something. So you can test faster than ever. Like used to be really hard. Like we didn't have these tools five, 10 years ago, right? So yeah, um, yeah I think the, the biggest mistake is like they either don't do, they don't niche down, they don't believe it's important or they think their business is special and they don't need to do it. Or they 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 do it, but they kind of overthink it and they, they go to in their head when really they need to just kind of discover it by testing and market research, right? And, and this is all like, so easy like you can just go on to google you can look up companies you can look up their competitors you can look up their reviews like it's all out there for you right yeah. um another 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 thing too is like they they divert right so they try a niche and then they take another client and take another, you know oh, let me just take this client over here take this client over here but then you're not niching down so you have to like once you know your direction so step one is like find your direction discover your niche right once you know okay i want to sell this thing to this niche then it's like you just need to go like all in on that and not take anything else. You can still maybe here and there experiment, um, but your experiment should still be close. So for example, we have a, we have a program for helping agencies, right? Scale their agency, uh, usually like at least double or triple their monthly revenue. And um, let's say that I want to work with a, uh, like a, let's say someone comes in our funnel and they're not really an agency, but they're similar. Like they offer like a B2B service. I would consider taking them because it's still the same delivery. It's still the same uh, promise, the same outcome, right? So like if you do experiment with other niches, try to keep it as simple as possible to like, do I deliver this thing the same way, right? If that makes sense. Um, yep. But yeah, the biggest one is just not doing it. It's just, it's not that hard. You just have to kind of do the thinking and the research. This is where an outside perspective, like a consultant or a coach helps because you can bounce ideas off of them. Um, but yeah, you just have to do it. And you have to like, once you find your niche, commit to it. Um, and then just like, don't look back, like go all in. Because honestly, it's easier to be the big fish in the small pond, right? all day, right? It's easier to be like, Hey, here's my small little pond and I'm just going to be the big, the king of it. Right. And I'm, you can still make a lot of money. Right. I think sometimes people, they tell me like, Oh, well, what if I like, I don't know if there's that much money in this market. Well, like, what do you mean? Like almost any industry, you could build an eight figure, nine figure company out of it. Right. If you really yeah. want. So don't, yeah. don't, under, don't, don't underestimate these small little weird niches. Right. Like you'd be, I'm sure you guys have seen it too. Right. From other 100%. clients of yours. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And and you know, like starting small, or starting on a niche doesn't mean that later on you cannot scale further. Actually, it it's the opposite. I will say, like, because once you have like a loyal customer base, you can use that to later on like expand or go more broad or launch new products and launch new features. Because yeah. they they will recommend you. You can use them as case studies, and 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 then you 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 know you come with a bunch of different new weapons. You know, so e even though like, yeah, so it, totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And I think, um, uh, just another mis mistake is like, uh, copying other people. Right. So yeah. when you see someone in, okay, so maybe someone watching this is like, okay, cool. AJ is helping agencies. Let me do that. Or they see someone else in the group. Oh, this guy's helping SaaS companies. Let me do that. Right. Don't do that. Because again, it's looking for the shortcut. If there's one yeah. thing you guys can take away regardless of Google updates and instantly and all these things, like just stop looking for the shortcut, just commit to doing one thing and, or getting closer to that, right? Because there is no shortcut. You just have to do one thing, get really good at it. Um, but yeah, don't try to look at like, if you see someone that was successful in another niche, let's say you see your buddy who's like, has a really successful e-commerce agency or a really successful uh, IT consulting agency, like, right, whatever it is, you can still pay attention to it. Those are still important. Those are still good, like indicators and like data points, but don't just do it because they did it. Because that's why I say it's looking for the shortcut. Cause it's like, oh, if I'm just trying to copy someone that was successful or, or do their niche, it's because I'm like just looking for the shortcut and I'm not trying to create my own thing. You have to discover your niche by knowing like, who do you want to work with? Right. And that, and the reason I say it's a shortcut is because all these niches work. There's no magic niche. There's no magic niche where you, I mean, there's, again, there's some niches where you'll be more profitable than others. There's some niches that are going to work better, but all across the board, 
all niches really work, right? Some work better than others, but it's like, you don't want to look for the magic one. It's more about like, just knowing they all kind of work and figuring out like what's going to work best for you. And part of that is like, who do you have fun working with? Right? So think back to your last 10, if you, if you're more experienced, think back to your last, you know, 10, 20, 30 clients, unless you're a beginner, either way, you can still get value to this, right? Think, think back to your last, you know, batch of clients, 10, 20, 30 clients or whatever. Right. And uh, just do an analysis and think about like, who was the most fun to work with? Who, who did I enjoy talking to? Who was I excited to help? Who did I like learning about? Like what industries did I like learning about? Cause I do think there's a lot of value in like doing some business where you actually enjoy the industry and the client. You don't have to, but it just makes it a little bit easier. Other than that, it's like, okay, who was the most profitable? Who was the easiest to sell? Um, but yeah, if you have clients already do that customer analysis, but just remember like you can work with anyone. It's just who do you want to work with and who's going to be a good fit for you. Yeah, no, I agree with you. That, that was awesome. I hope you guys listened to that because that was gold. Right <laughs> <there>. <laughs> so yeah. let's, um, let's answer some questions from the community. So, yeah. so here from Borgi Technologies, they are asking, Hey, we are an MSP and looking for directions to drive engagement, utilizing, um, instantly. At what scale do you feel we need to send in a niche car dealership? So I guess, so they're into the niche car dealership. Um, and, uh, hmm. yeah, like what, what recommendations will you have for someone like that? I feel like they probably need like a few recommendations. I, I will say like, I don't know, like in terms of volume, um, and who to target, I guess that, that would be like a good start. Like, have you ever had like a similar situation there? Like anything for those people? In that yeah. We definitely had a lot of clients, uh, B2B clients, agency clients that have like a very tiny niche, not niche car dealerships, but any other like, yeah, lots of random things that are very small. So it sounds like the question is like, hey, my niche is very small. What do I do? Right. Um, so I would say, and I'm, yeah, I'm curious to hear your thoughts as well, Felipe. First, I would say when you say drive engagement using instantly, I would better define that goal. What does yeah. drive engagement mean? How many clients do you want a month? How much revenue do you want to generate from this channel, right? Because if you have a specific number, then you can work backwards. So like, okay, here's how many emails I need to send. So I would take drive engagement and make that a more specific goal. If you, if maybe you have already somewhere else, but that's the first thing that sticks out. And then at what scale do you feel we need to send in each car dealership? Yeah. I mean, without knowing more about what you do, I would just recommend like if it's the smaller, the niche, the more you really need to personalize it. Right. Um, so if I'm selling to like all car dealerships in the world, I can get away with not personalizing it. If there's only 1000 businesses in the market, you want to get more juice out of that list. So you need to kind of have a strategy where you're getting more juice out of that list. So, uh, yeah, and we can flip it over to you, Felipe, to maybe talk about like some numbers, benchmarks that you guys recommend it instantly. But I would say in general, make sure you're going for that quality first approach and personalize it. Yeah, hundred percent. I think like we can also like go back to what you were saying of, um, you know, try different angles, um, you know, mm. trying different like states. Maybe there are some states that will perform better. Maybe there are some yeah. um, positions that will perform better, even like some some brands that might perform better even because obviously, you know, some maybe some dealerships, you know, they are they sure, are like yeah. established with certain brands. So I guess it will it, that will also be related with like who is their end customer. You know, maybe some end customers, you know, they have more mm. money than others. Um, so yeah, I think long story short, like, yeah, I will like start launching an A-B testing, like a bunch of different campaigns, collect feedback, talk to them. And from there, like start improving, um, like, and like you said, like no shortcuts, like just start launching campaigns, start collecting feedback, use that data and make that data driven decisions. So, yeah. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Instantly is really great. Not just for getting clients, but for testing your niche. Right. So you, like all those things Felipe just said, just, you can go test those and anyone else listening. You can do that in your own niche too, right? Testing niche, industry, state, right? Location, like that's it instantly makes it pretty easy to A-B test all that stuff. Yeah. So I, I think we have another question here from Alex Cabrera. So AG, you mentioned that Google changes, um, that the Google that, that the, the Google changes making the cold emails payload list accessible to most agencies, but more fruitful for operations that are able to adapt. How can we best prepare for the changes? So I guess like some recommendations for the changes, but I guess like that's like the standard like call email best practices. So yeah. What yeah. Recommendations you have? Well, yeah, you said something really uh, intelligent there, like that just get better at the best practices, right? So how do you prepare when things are getting harder? You just get better, right? So more specifically in terms of deliverability, then, you know, you want to like instantly have some really good guides for this too. I do as well. You can just, you know, always message me on social media. I always share like our SOPs and stuff, but um. You just want to make sure the deliverability is like really solid, like all the base. If you don't already know, like the DNS records, the warm up, um, you know, like sending the right amount per day, not sending like 100 emails per day. So make sure those basics are covered and get really good at those basics and fundamentals. Right. There's definitely some advanced deliverability stuff that I'm sure you guys 
also talk about it instantly, right? Like spin tax and like things beyond that. Um, but yeah, it's really like just get a lot better at the fundamentals, right? So the fundamentals are deliverability, their copy, their offers. And by offers also, that's like lead magnets. If you want to test lead magnets, I recommend everyone does that. Um, and then targeting. And then there's also the operations behind that. So it's like, okay, there's deliverability, there's copy and offers, lead magnets, and targeting. And then there's the operations as in like, what's the process? Do I have a VA doing this, right? Um, am I doing this myself? You know, what tools are we using? Are we using instantly, right? So I would say it's just, it's less about doing something different and new. It's more about look at what you're already doing when it comes to cold email and just get like a thousand times better to just keep learning, keep studying, keep doing it. Um, because you can never go wrong with just, you know, kind of getting better. And that's always going to protect you from these market conditions that we don't really uh, control. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you on that one. Like, I think we summarize it into like the fundamentals, good technical setup, good database, uh, good uh, target of people and good copy. I think you nail those four fundamentals and you should have, you should have a good base. Obviously, they are obviously they, there's more room for improvement. But I guess like if you nail those, like you should be pretty safe. With Absolutely. Base. Pretty safe with that. And if you haven't and then the prerequisite is have a clear niche and a clear offer, right? Because if you don't have those things and every, all those other things, everything else kind of builds on top. Like marketing kind of builds on top of the foundation of your business, which is the the niche and the offer and the messaging and positioning. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Great question. 100%. Yeah, that was a great question. So Vukasin is asking, how do you personalize? Is it always, hi, I saw your post reaction on platform X. So let's maybe, yeah, let's talk maybe about personalization. So what is your approach on that? Yeah, so I think um, first, hello, Bukasin. I remember you. We were just chatting on Facebook the other day. He's in, he's oh, nice. in our Facebook group too. Um, <laughs> nice. So cool, cool, we made it here. Small world of marketing and cold email. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I'd say you know. So the way I look at personalization is either do it well or don't do it. Because if you just say, "Hey, I saw that you have a business," which is it sounds silly, but that's what people sometimes do, right? Hey, I yeah. saw you have a coaching business. By the way, I offer this, right? Um, so do person. If you're going to do personalization, make sure it seems genuine. And I know there's AI personalization, which is really worth exploring too, but you have to make sure your AI personalization does not make it seem crappy and generic because yeah. it just hurts you. Because if I, okay, let's say, Felipe, let's say me, we met at like a coffee shop or something or like a, a bar or something. Um, and I don't know, do you drink? No. Do you or? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, not, cool. Not, so not, not every <laughs> not day, right? No, I'm <laughs> I read that. Okay, so it's just a way of an example. Right? Okay, let's say me and you were like, you know, our friends at a bar and like I meet you and we're like, oh, cool. Nice to meet you. And I give you a really crappy compliment. Like, I love your green shirt. You'd be like, is this guy being like fake or something? Right. Um, yeah. And it's, it's the same thing. Right. So it's like if you're going to like give someone a personalization is kind of usually giving someone like a compliment or a reason for reaching out. So if you meet someone in your regular life, a friend, maybe like like a like a, you know, someone you want to date. Right. Guy or girl, whatever. If you meet someone in real life and you give them a really crappy generic compliment, they're going to be like, it would have been better if you just said like, hi, like, why do you have to say like my shirt screen? Right. Um, yeah. So that's kind of what people do in their marketing, right? They give these generic compliments like, oh, I saw your website looks really good. And then they get into their pitch. That's the same as yeah. going up to again, like a, like a friend or like a, you know, whatever. And just giving this very like, just, it's just like soulless, right? It's just like you're trying too yeah. hard. Right. Yeah. Um, so, and by the way, it is a great shirt of green, a great shade of green. Not I'm trying to, you know, just your shirt, Felipe, it's a solid, uh, solid shirt. Uh, <laughs> Appreciate yeah. It. <laughs> but yeah, so, so just the first thing is you have to know what not to do. Don't just have a generic compliment. Cause again, it's just, if, if you, whenever you're wondering like what to say in your copy, just think about real life. That's why I always use these examples. Like what would you say to a friend at a coffee shop or a bar? Or what would you say to like a, a girl you were, you know, trying to date or something, right? Just think about how you would say you act in a normal social situation. And if you can bring that online, it's always going to be more like more genuine, less weird, right? So yeah. if you're if you can if you can personalize on something good, don't really do it. It's, you can still have a good outreach campaign that does not personalize anything. We do it all the time, right? I know probably some people are like going to shame me for that, but like yeah, you don't personalization helps, but like you can also just have the same template, and if it's good enough, they'll respond. Uh, but yeah, as far as how do you personalize? Find something general. Uh, sorry, not general. Find something genuine that relates to them. Um, so instead of like, uh, you know, instead of me being like, oh, Felipe, that's a really nice green shirt. If I was like, dude, I saw you work at it like instantly. That's so cool because I was just looking into you guys. Like now it's a much more regular conversation, yeah. right? Um, and, and so basically find a, something genuine to compliment. And there's still a way I can do this, right? It's, it's kind of getting there. I'm curious also what you guys are doing, Felipe, because I know you guys do some really cool stuff with this too and probably see a lot. But um, yeah, the biggest takeaway is just have something genuine. 
And the best thing is if you can point out something relevant to your offer. So it's one thing to be like, oh, Felipe, I saw that you, you're you a, a Knicks fan. Go Knicks, right? People do that. They do like the AI personalization with like a sports yeah. team, which I don't, you know. So I get, I get this a lot. Like, oh, you know, go Knicks. And I'm like, yeah, I was kind of a hockey guy, but that's okay. Whatever. I'll let you, you know, at least you tried, right? <laughs> yeah, um, at least I tried, yeah. So when you do a genuine compliment, um, that's nice. That's a really good way to start the conversation. But if you want to go a step further, make a compliment that's relevant to your, relevant to their business and your offer. Because if I'm just like, you know, hey, um, I saw that you're a Knicks fan, go Knicks. And then I get into my offer. There's almost a little bit of like, a, it's like, why did you bring that up? Kind of. It's still like nice, I guess. Yeah. But there's there can be a little bit of a disconnect. So the best personalization is the ones related to your business. So let's say I'm like, um, Felipe, I saw that you guys were hiring. That's why I thought I should reach out, right? Or whatever it is, right? Felipe, you guys posted this on social media last week. That's what made me think about this. And that's why I wanted to reach out. So if you can try to find something that is uh, legitimate, that also actually relates to your offer, that's even better. So one of our clients, uh, we have a couple of clients that have like e-com agencies. So we help them use cold email to get like e-com clients. So one thing we did was we said like, you know, and this was still automated. It wasn't completely personalized, but it was still automated. We had them reach out to stores and be like, hey, I noticed you had a couple of problems on your store. Can I send you a quick loom audit? And that crushes it every single time, right? Nice. Um, so personalization works better if it's relevant to your your offer, pretty much. Yeah. No, no I, I I completely agree with you on that one. And I, and I also feel like you know uh, because like now it's harder than ever to stand out. Like going like being very brief and like also people on their smartphones, you know, they they see a preview of their message or of their email. Like the, I feel like the first lines are key. So if you're wasting like your first line on like something that is like. Totally, you know, like, totally, yeah, yeah, yeah that's good so, point. But but if you're like going straight to the point with something that is relevant to your business, like 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 you said, like, hey, I saw that you guys posted about this, or I saw that you guys did this, or or say that, and then you connected with your offer, like that definitely shows that you did your due diligence, even though it's automated. But also, it's funny because um, it's it's funny you mentioned you know this this whole like trend on generic like messages and stuff like that because. Today I had a funny situation. So basically, one guy like connected on me, uh, connected with me via LinkedIn, and you know he sent me a message which I wasn't sure if it was generic or not. So I replied back, and then the guy like you know replied back like with with another question that looks super generic. And because it's the second message that looks so generic, I just replied back. I was like, um, you know, like honestly, like I don't know if this is an automated message or not, but like it sounds so generic. And the guy replied back like. Actually, I wrote all of these myself, and I was like, "Oh, oh man, that's so sad! That's wow. so sad!" You know, like that you actually <laughs> took the time to write a message yourself, but it still looked like, or sounded like an AI. Because I feel like, like deep inside ourselves, I feel like now more than ever, we're all the time like scanning messages and thinking, "Is this generic or not?" Like you know, so um, yeah, sure. yeah. And, and you're a marketer, right? So when you sell, if you do sell, the marketers are, if you sell, they're more sophisticated buyer. They know all the tricks, right? So it becomes even more uh, important to stand out, and yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with you. So let's go for the next one. So from Infamous, what's the KPI for booking an appointment? So yeah, what are your key KPIs? Like what 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 do you track? Like personally, I like to go for like the uh, post like reply rates or positive reply rates. Um, I guess that those are my key KPIs. Like open rate is nice, but like I feel like it's a vanity metric in a way. Um, so yeah. I, I don't know, like what what are those KPIs that you track? Maybe you go deeper into the KPIs. Maybe you go for, um, I don't know, like maybe actual calls book. Like, right? What are what are those KPIs that that you feel like are key uh, in general, or those that you advise people building their funnel? Like, I mean, integrating into their funnel. Yeah, yeah, really good question. Um, I'm pulling up a doc on my screen. I'm not gonna screen share. I just I have some notes. I'll share real quick. Um, okay. Just real quick, Felipe, what are you? Do you guys at instantly have any like? Standards you give people as far as like, oh, for every 200 emails, you should get one book to call. I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that too while I pull this thing up. Um, well, that depends really. Like I think it, it really depends on the niche and the, and the offer yeah. because, uh, you know, there are some niches and some offers that just they perform amazing. Um, and then, for example, for e-commerce, um, digital agencies, um, yeah, you just need to be, be a little bit more realistic and conservative. So when you have like, you know, like a reply rate that is not like a 20%, but let's say like a two to five reply rate. Actually, that's a good reply rate for that's e fine, Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's a good one. So I think um, I think at the end of the day, it just comes down to, yeah, what's your niche and offer? Um, so we definitely go for reply rates, positive reply rates. We also keep an eye down the funnel into uh, how many of those actually book a call. Obviously, you want to make sure that, you know, like um, people actually show up for calls as well. Um, 
And yeah. lastly, obviously, your close rates. So I think like those are the essentials. Like you can go like even further, but also it will depend on what's your sales process. Maybe your sales process does not require all to have a call. Maybe it's essential to have a call. So it, it will depend on mm -hmm. like, like the yeah, yeah, practice. awesome. Yeah, I totally agree with that. So I just pulled up. Um, yeah, they definitely agree. It definitely depends on the niche offer and and, and uh, yeah, some are low competition, some are high competition. By the way, guys, you know, a good thing you can study on niche offer is Google uh, market sophistication uh, and stages of awareness. So people, a certain buyer has a stage of awareness. You guys have probably heard there's, you know, they're unaware, then they're problem aware, then they're solution aware. But also a market has its, has its own stages of awareness and its layer of uh, level of sophistication. So you got to know if you're in a competitive, if you're in a competitive market, like you're targeting e-commerce agencies, you should have a killer lead magnet every time. Do something for free for them, right? Um, if you're in a, if you're in a very like low competition market or maybe a very new market, you can go direct pitch, book a call and you'll be good to go. So just side note on that, um, is always know what market you're dealing with. And when I forget about like fancy words, like sophistication and whatnot, it's, it's good to Google it. Like look up, there's a whole, there's a lot of studies on it, but fancy words aside, it's like how many other people are selling the same thing as you in your niche? If there's a lot, and if the competition has been burned over and over and over again, then you have to change your strategy. You're now dealing with trust and like get to the point and like, why are you different, right? You don't really need a USP if you're in a brand new market, you're the first one there, honestly, you're just there, right? It's like, um, it's back to like, you know, real life stories, right? Let's say, you know, like, um, uh, I'm not single, I have, a, I have a wife now, I'm married, but like, let's say that there's a single guy and he goes to do a bar and there's a thousand girls. Well, he doesn't even need to be like the most good looking guy on the planet. There's like, yeah. you know, there's, they're gonna be like sharks, right? So uh, you have to kind of know what market you're dealing with. Um, and. A, a, that doesn't mean that competitive markets are bad. It just means you have to be different and better. And that's usually having a really good offer, USP and lead magnet. But anyways, um, on the actual stats, I think you nailed it. Like you can go really deep, um, but the basics are like, yeah, apply rate, positive reply rate. Um, and the other ones you said, I mean, just to kind of go through like my notes real quick. I just think about each, I just think about a sales funnel as a series of steps, right? Yeah. So just think about what are the steps in your sales process, right? Usually for a service based business, it's like new lead, right? New lead comes in. So, okay, so even back to cold email, there's open rate, there's reply rate, there's positive reply rate, right? So positive reply rate is like new lead, right? So there's new lead and then there's LTA. I think everyone doing cold email, if you're not tracking LTA, lead to appointment, you have to, right? 100%, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I can't wait to hear your perspective on it because I've- yes, 100%, um, we, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right? So I love how we're nerding out. I just say like three, let LTA and you're like, yes, let's go, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so one of our clients, when they started calling leads, as soon as they came in from instantly, the LTAs went up like 60%. So LTAs lead to appointment, right? Because I, it's really, it really sucks if you get like 100 leads or whatever, 10 leads in a week, and only one of the books a call, right? Yeah. It's a lot harder to get, it's a lot harder to get from 10 leads to 20 leads than it is to get from 10 leads, but at least three of them book a call, right? So don't just think about more leads, think about lead to appointment ratio, right? Um, and then, and then once you have your lead to appointment ratio up, which is really like speed to contact and other things, lead, lead to appointment ratio. Um, we try to get our clients always a minimum, like 40 to 60%. So yeah, if you get 10 leads, they're not all going to book in calls. Right. Um, because they, they just, they're not all that interested. Um, but calling them helps re uh, replying to fast helps too. So you track lead, uh, LTA, uh, then you track, of course, calls booked, um, really like. The conversion rates they will depend on your sales process but the the conversions you need to track is of course lta show rate like you said felipe right how many people are showing up to the calls because if only half of them show up like let's fix that so lta uh percentage show rate percentage then you want to track qualified close percentage qualified close percentage is not how many if i take 10 calls and they're all like not really a good fit and i don't offer them my service that doesn't mean yeah. i suck at sales and i can't i'm over 10. That means I'm really zero for zero if you consider quality. That means it's a marketing problem, right? So qualified close rates means out of how many prospects who are qualified, we define that by like, did they, did you give them an offer? If you gave them an offer, they're qualified. You wouldn't give an offer to someone who wasn't qualified, right? So qualified close rate is more important to track. And by the way, if this sounds overwhelming, like simple spreadsheet, right? Like you could even like message me after the show or I can even drop in a template in the instantly wherever this is going in the group. Um, so I'm always happy to share like a template with you guys if you want, but simple spreadsheet, just like, Lead to appointment ratio, um, show rate, qualified close rate, because again, it's a whole different story. If I have 10 deals, 10 appointments, and all of them got an offer and I closed only one, that's a problem, right? But if I had 10 deals and I only gave two of them an offer and I closed one, that's great. I have a 50% qualified close rate. Now I need to get better quality leads in, right? So yeah, lead to appointment, show rate, qualified close rate. And then you can track other things like, you know, 
how many of them upsell and stuff later, but that's at least the main ones for the, the sales process. Nice. You have you have some great me metrics like yourself and your agency, I have to say. <laughs> like for the like considering the niche you're in, like yeah, you have some great, great metrics right there. So in terms um, of the niche I'm in, how, how do you mean by that? Like for example, you know, you you were you were just saying that you have like a sixty percent um, you know, show up rate for the meetings. Um yeah. or so yeah, that that's a fantastic rate. Like because uh, I feel like um, a lot of people, they just want to sell to anyone, really. And then what happens at the end of the day is that you might end up with a client. And I think you nailed it on that one. Um, like some people, like they will feel like, oh, this person is a bad salesperson because he's he's basically not closing every single sale. And sometimes like, you do not want to close every single sale because you might close like a business to the wrong person that might suck up all of your time trying to provide them support yeah, yeah. or something that actually you will never be able to uh, deliver. And or the other way around, like maybe they will just um you know last one two months and they will realize themselves that you know they got into something that is not for them and then they will churn you know they will just leave the the, the yeah service that's and... why it's that and that's a great great uh great point that's why it's not all about like we said not just about getting more leads you really got to think about the whole business first step is like you just you gotta learn how to get lead that's step one but then you gotta really like I really think a lot of people they need to transition from marketer to business owner, right? You yeah. start out as a marketer, but you have to kind of graduate to business owner. And for me, I'm a very like creative guy. I love marketing. So this has been a really long, grueling process for me. Like, like I, like if, if like the past me five years ago heard me today talking about like metrics and KPIs and spreadsheets to be like, who's this guy? Right. So I'm, yeah. I'm not really like a numbers person. I, I mean, I told you I dropped out of college. Right. So I had to learn yeah. this stuff, but you have to learn these things about like the business side if you really want to scale because otherwise you're just you're winging it you know yeah i mean now now that the whole Saltman, sam altman topic and the open ai is out there you know and like like everyone is talking about it i guess like we can quote oh him yeah and, he, and, and even he said it himself you know like when i think someone asked him um while he was uh, you know like um um you know like doing a speech in a in a university basically someone asked him if he had to choose for like the best type of founder would it be a technical like someone who is like extremely focused on the technicalities or will it be like a generalist you know someone with a broad perspective of the business and i think that's connected with what you just mentioned that you know like you could start as a marketer but as you go like uh as your business grows you need to like think more as a business owner and, and have more of a general perspective because i feel like a marketer they just want to deliver you know like leads 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 but you know like then is then is when they start having like these problems with the sales team and the sales team is like oh these leads you know sales they're team. like not good they're not qualified and i think as a business yeah. owner like you need to think of everything at the same time so yeah i think i think you nailed it with that one yeah i mean um, and then that topic we could have a whole podcast just about that right I, I really think it's like the game it's it's all about stages right what stage are you at what revenue level are you at and what do you got to focus on then right really at first it's not even marketing it's sales first you just got to sell someone then you then it's more marketing to repeat sales and then it's more like business operation right yeah. um but yeah if, if anyone listening is like kind of doesn't really like the business side or they're like not good at it i was not good at all of that right i had to like yeah. learn about hiring and management and leadership and all these things right so yeah yeah um, check Check this comment from Craig. So Craig is saying, I second uh, basically what, what you were saying. So um, we have had the same message that has worked for us for three years. Kudos to you, Craig. Three years with the same message. Oh, and crazy. we and got us 600 clients from call email. Every time I try to change the message, we struggle with deliverability. <laughs> that's crazy. And that's that's that just shows, guys, that, you know, like once you find the right niche, you just if you stick to it and you're consistent like the results will be there and i, and I guess we can see that craig like when it, like now he just found it whenever he tries to make changes to something that has been working for him and getting him 600 customers already like yeah it's that's amazing you know. that's that's like a not a story i hear every day i haven't never heard that story that's awesome um but yeah, yeah. keep getting the next 600 right and um yeah that's, yeah. that's amazing <laughs> So Nigel is asking, um, what about sending personalized videos via emails uh, as a strategy? So what are your thoughts on that? What is, what is your experience on it? Like you mentioned sending looms. Um, mm. So yeah, what, what, yeah. What, what is your experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, um, so whenever we have a, an, an agency client that's in a competitive niche, we always recommend them like do some lead magnet. Um, and a personalized video emails is, a way to do a lead magnet, right? Or a loom audit is a, a lead magnet, right? So just to kind of clarify the terms for everyone. Um, also, what's up, Nigel? I think we're we've, we've been talking on LinkedIn and Facebook, so this really is a small world. But yeah, good to see you, dude. Um, <laughs> personalized video email. So best tip I can give you is if you're doing, if you're going to do a lead magnet where you have to do like a customized thing, like a loom audit, like not send a PDF, like actually make them a video or make them an audit or do something for them 
or even give them a free thing, like a deliverable, um, have them opt into it first. So what our, what we, like our process for, for our like cold email strategy with this, um, which again, works in all channels, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever, is don't just send someone a video, be like, Hey, I want to make, I made this for you, or I want to make it for you. It's even better to say like, I made it for you, or I'm going to make it for you. Uh, who should I send it to? Best thing you can do. Right. So instead of saying, instead of, you know, getting 10 businesses and making like 10 videos, which takes you all day, just being like, get a hundred businesses and be like, Hey, I made you a video. Um, who should I send it to? And whoever replies, go make their video. Right. Um, because if you get them to opt in first, you're only making videos for people who want it. So definitely great strategy, but you have to get, you have to make sure they opt in. If you mean like, if the question is more like, should I send them a personalized video in the email outreach? I'm pretty sure you'll have deliverability problems. Um, but if you're doing like LinkedIn or something else, then that's fine. But still like, you got to know if you're going for volume or, or, or quality first, right? So like the other dude that has uh, uh, the card niche dealership, if he has a really small industry, he probably should send personalized videos because he has, he has to get the most juice out of his list. So yeah, hard to say without knowing more. Um, but I think, yeah, it just depends on how big is your market and how much is a client worth. So think about the client LTV, right? If I have a small market and my client's worth a lot, like if I'm reaching out to Fortune 500 companies, yes, I'll send personalized videos. I'll figure out how to do it all day because they need like the LTV is so high. It's worth the time. Right. So that's a, that's a good framework of how you can think about, is it worth it to put an effort for each prospect? How much is the prospect worth to you? And also how big is the, the market? Yeah, no, I completely, I completely agree with you on that one. Yeah. So next question from Michelle. So you mentioned not altering an email campaign every three months. Um, what metrics do you use to decide when it's time to alter and will you just tweak or start from scratch? So I guess this is about A-B testing and mm. yeah, like changing the copy. So what, what are your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, great question. First of all, A-B testing is one of my favorite things about Instantly because you guys make it so easily. Quick feature requests. If you can make it easier to see the results at like step three, four, five, that'd be really good. Because like, sometimes it would be cool if you can trace it back to the first message. Because I can see yeah. like, okay, step two got replies, but what was the first message that was part of? I had to say that, yeah. right? Sorry to put yeah, no, no, please. Uh, we, we, uh, look, look. Just to be clear, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you and if it wasn't for the community because we take your feedback very seriously. So yeah, that's, that's why, why we awesome. keep we keep launching features. So I'm taking notes of this. So yeah, please. Yeah, cool. So like for <laughs> example, if I send email one and then email two is any thoughts, I get a positive reply in email two, but I don't know which email one it came from, right? So we have to do that manually. But anyways, um, yeah, I all that to say, I love the A/B testing feature. It's so easy to A/B test and instantly. So great question. Um. I'm going to answer this, then I'm going to kick it over to you, Felipe, to see what you guys think about A-B testing, because you guys created the tool. So I'm curious what you would recommend too. But my answer is, um, Michelle, when I mentioned uh, not altering an email campaign every three months, I wasn't necessarily just saying the email campaign. I was saying more like the business or the method. Some people, they change, they try cold email for three months, it doesn't work. They try LinkedIn, it doesn't work. They try Facebook. Does The niche doesn't work for three months, they try a new niche or they try a new offer. So I was more talking about like... Um, more like the strategy and the method you're doing. A lot of people, they, they give up on that too early, right? Um, so I would say like, if you did have a cold email campaign that didn't work for three months, then you do want to, that is, you do want to switch that and try something new. Um, so just to clear that up, I was more talking about like the higher level stuff. Like don't change your channel, don't change your method, don't change your niche every three months. Um, but yeah, in terms of like, you know, A-B testing and whatnot, we usually just try to have, make sure every, so let's say I'm running a campaign and we're testing four different messages. We try to make sure each message gets at least 300 to 500 contacts because if you you need a sample size that's big enough right it's the same way with facebook ads you make sure you spend enough so that's a, uh, relevant data right um so i would say like you know whenever you're testing make sure that the sample size is big enough a metric that i just use is like 300 to 500 so if i've sent 500 emails to if i have four different copies i'm testing and i want to send 500 contacts for each right so that's 2000 total so First, make sure you have at least a big enough sample size, right? Rule of thumb for me is just 300 to 500. You'll start to see like, because eventually when you send, the more, the bigger your data, like the more of a sample size of something, the more it represents the whole uh, population. There's probably like a term for that in like math, but the, the bigger the sample size, the more it'll kind of level out. Um, so make sure that the sample size is big enough. And then in terms of when it's time to alter, um, yeah, it's just if it's working or not. So like, you got to know your goals, right? Back to like numbers and, and metrics. You got to know your goal. And, and by goals, I don't just mean I want a 10% reply rate because that sounds cool. I mean, like, how much money do you want to make this month? How much money do you want to make this year? Right? Like, most people don't even really, like, when I ask someone, like, what are their goals? It's usually a fuzzy answer, right? You got to, and that's okay because no one really teaches us in school how to set goals. They just give us a bunch of other useless crap. Um, 
But like, you got to really know, like, what do I want to actually achieve in the end? How much, how many clients do I want? What do I want them to pay me? How much money do I want to make this month, this year? And that's, so you got to start with goal setting. You got to start from the end and work backwards to the present. So if you, assuming, you know, like how much you want to grow this year, how many clients you want, how much profit you want to make, not just revenue, but profit. Then you got to kind of make your, your KPIs to that. Cause it's like, okay, if my cold email campaigns are working and I'm sending five different variations of, of, of my copy um, and I'm on track for my yearly goal, then like, you don't need to change anything. You can try some new things on the side, but like, just let it keep running because you're going to hit your goal. Right. So that's why a lot of people, they get stuck because they don't really have a clear goal or like an end in mind. Um, so again, the, uh, that's just a long way of saying of, uh, basically your, your KPI should be based on your goal, right? So KPIs are different for everyone, right? Your KPIs and your targets need to be based on a longer term goal, right? And if you're, and then you, all you have to do is make sure that your KPIs are mapping to that goal, right? So for example, if I want three clients a month and my campaign's getting me, you know, like 15 calls, three clients a month, I don't need to do anything. I can just sit back, close and onboard the clients, right? Um, so when you decide to alter based on how your performance is, which is comparison to your goal. So there's no really exact stat I can give you. It's just more like what is like just after the call today, like decide your goal. If you, if you already have it, define your goal and then just work backwards. So like how many appointments, how many clients do I need to hit that? Right. And then just make sure your cold email is getting towards that. And if it's not, then you shut it off or you change different copy. Right. If it is, you just let it keep running. Um, and, I'll, and also here's another thing too. Let's say that you have five different campaigns or like five different email templates and all of them are getting leads, but one of them is getting the most leads. Some people would just shut everything else off and get that one with the most leads. I probably wouldn't. I think is, is it in the KPI, right? I, so basically, if something's working, if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? If something's working, keep it in the keep it keep it running. So for example, like back to the if I'm running five different email templates and all of them are getting leads, and three of them are like within my target goal, and one of them is doing the best. Yeah, there's maybe like maybe I should you know consider only doing one, but honestly, if all three of them are getting you with leads within your goal, like just leave them on. Right. Cause then if one yeah. stops working, you have the others. So don't shut something off. If it's getting, if it's helping you achieve your desired goal. Right. Um, but yeah, you just have to kind of check it, check it once a week, once every two weeks and just kind of see how it's trending. Also, like another thing is don't just look at reply rate and positive reply rate. That's, that's important, but it's a leading indicator. So you guys can Google like leading indicators versus lagging yeah. indicators. Um, most important metric is like how much money's in the bank at the end of the month. Right. Yeah. Um, cause one, one campaign could get you a really crappy reply rate, but the leads are like, they're more motivated because maybe it was a more direct message and they, and they, they pay more or they sign up, you know, the close rates higher. So always just, you know, like track through the, to the end. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, just to finish with the last questions, um, because maybe AJ has another meeting. I don't know how, do you have another meeting now or like, I uh, no, I don't. It's actually, by the way, for everyone here, it's 1am I'm in Vietnam right now. I live in Asia. I'm from New York, oh. but I'm living here. So this is like the end of the day. <laughs> wow that's that's what i call hustle, hustling like 1 a.m wow that that's great so guys yeah I'll be um, sleeping in the <laughs> yeah take advantage of this because uh yeah that's that's incredible yeah Lots yeah i have time for more questions guys. though yeah 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 you, you mentioned you're married right yeah how do you do it I like mean, to work at 1 a.m and you know with uh or, or, or is your partner like is, is she with you or uh or is in the, is it in the u.s no she's here i met her i met her here four years ago so she's actually vietnamese um oh okay but awesome. yeah, well, awesome. funny enough, she's my she's my business partner too. So we kind of will like both work at night. So yeah, oh, that that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I was yeah. thinking about it. Like, how do you do work work till one a.m. and like, yeah, with the wife being cool with it. Yeah, normally that's normally amazing. a wife would get mad at that, right? They'd be like, "Come on, hurry up!" And so <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think you nailed it. Like even even with that, you're extremely efficient. So yeah, lots of respect. Yeah. Maybe also, next quick, quick next point. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. To say that last part. I mean to cut you off. No, I just I just want to say like maybe the next one like you could be at giving like a marriage advice and not just call email but like how to find <laughs> the right business partner and the right partner in general and stuff like that. But yeah. yeah, that's fun to talk about yeah. too. Marriage advice is just try to listen to your wife because they always end up being right. Um, yeah. But <laughs> but yeah, uh, I think I just just quick point about that though. I um, I'm working till one a.m. I don't work eighteen hours a day. I like to chill and draw my life. I usually just work in the afternoons and evenings because of time zone. But I want to make that point like you don't need to be working a crazy amount of time a day. So I don't want anyone thinking that I'm working at 1 a.m. because I'm like working 18 hours a day. I think honestly, we're more productive when we work six to eight hours a day doing focused work. Side note, yep. topic for another day. But uh, yeah, like make time to enjoy life too, right? I agree with um, you. I, have, I actually have a daughter and I, I think that, that kind of hit me when when my daughter was born. Um, you yeah. know, like basically to, um, 
yeah like you like like it's important like to spend time with family and friends you know to have hobbies to dedicate it for work like obviously everyone has their own approach for this to this kind of stuff and and things work differently for different people although, but i guess that's that's what works for me you know like it, it's it's just more fulfilling so yeah you gotta do what works for you for sure um yeah but yes but I anyway, see yeah. yeah let's answer this question so the question goes everyone talks about using cold email to book more demos and meetings but what about uh, low value SaaS subscriptions for example fifty dollars a month um we're doing mm -hmm. demos doesn't work economically uh we'll call email work so what will you recommend in these kind of cases yeah um great question and uh i'm also i i'm i'm guessing you guys have a lot of SaaS clients i'm also curious if you have any insider knowledge on that too felipe but for me one of our like biggest clients we've had forever has a service that's like 100 bucks a month and they do demos. And honestly, most SaaS companies that are at 50 bucks, 100 bucks a month, bucks a month, they do demos. So um, this is kind of more, not that you have to, but like you see a lot of these big companies, they do demos, they find a way to make it work, right? And maybe that's upsells, maybe that's a higher tier plan, or maybe that's like, you know, whole nother conversation if you want to get funded and like spend a lot of money. But um, not to say that you can't make it work without doing demos, just it's a belief in your head that doing a demo doesn't work economically. There's a, yeah. there's a way around that other people have done it. Right. So you got to, that's, that's more of a business model question though. Um, I know that, uh, yeah, like cold email is really your best bet because what's the other option paying for ads. There's, it's going to be impossible, right? You can't really pay for ads with SaaS unless you are like VC backed or unless you're like have super rich parents or something. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with you. I think, I think the right approach to this is like, what will be the, the best channel to drive people into my SaaS and then like, take that feedback to improve my product. So I, I guess like when you start looking into acquisition channels, like, yeah, I think like ads are like out of question. Uh, out of SEO question, yeah. just SEO takes way too long. Uh, yeah, I know everyone says that, right? It's like, it's how it is. So, so yeah, well, like, what is what is it left? Just call email so you can validate like whatever you're offering. Um, and I guess like, like if, even as a plan B, okay, let's say like this person is very fixated with not doing demos, right? Um, even then, you're building a lot of brand, brand awareness. Like you're like, let's say, let's say you believe that I don't know, like every single pharmacy in whichever country uh, will buy my product, like for my my SaaS solution, whatever it is. Like we don't know what what the SaaS solution does, but let's say it's yeah. for pharmacists, right? Um, you know, once you contact all of the all of them, like they will hear about you, they will know your name, they will, and, and some of them will actually go to your website. So I guess like you 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 nail it with that one. It, it has to do with like the whole like business plan because maybe like they they just don't have like a good landing page and that's not converting well or maybe um they don't have a retargeting pixel on their website so when people visit a website like you're not gonna remind them later on on other places or, or like like you know via ads that you actually exist so yeah i i guess like it, it, i guess like call email as an acquisition channel it's like the obvious thing i guess it's the obvious it, thing yeah that's why yeah that's why a lot of SaaS companies do outbound or they have outbound teams um yeah really good point it's like what it's like it's really your best bet um so i would say um by the way i have a, a case study of a SaaS client that we helped like get their first 42 like deals from it so if anyone wants that like just again find me on social media maybe you guys can drop my facebook or linkedin below i'm super active always willing to share a lot of stuff but uh yeah uh minty you can mess me on social media i can share that with you because that's like gonna show you how they did it um or anyone can but i would say in terms of what we found there so they are doing demos and honestly like their business would not be as successful as it was if they weren't doing demos because every demo they get they learn about their customer again market research knowing the language of your target customer is the most it's gold it's worth more than like like if i offer to give you ten thousand dollars or if i offer to give you like a complete understanding of your target market most people would take the 10 grand but that's not what they should take they should take the full understanding of the target market. So like, there's nothing more valuable to your business really than truly understanding your target market, their pains, their challenges, their goals, their limiting beliefs. Um, so yeah, in terms of uh, your question, Minty, cold email definitely works. If you really didn't want to do demos, you'd have to like talk them through it over email and like answer some questions. And you'd have to have a really, yeah. really, really good landing page and like funnel. But the only way you get a really good landing page and, and VSL and funnel and sales process is if you do the things that don't scale, which is do demos and find out consumer language and put that in your process. So yeah. um, I don't know what your situation is, but like demos can definitely work economically. You can make them work and you have to, you really have to do them because that's how you like are going to figure out how your market works and figure out, you know, you know what they always say, right? Do the things that don't scale. I'm a big believer in that. I do things that don't scale, right? 
Um, so yeah. like, don't be afraid to hop on the phone with your customers, even though it sounds like a dream to have like people just paying you recurring money and you never talk to them. Right. That sounds awesome. <laughs> you can, you can get there, but you don't get there just right away. Right. So yeah. anyways, I hope that, yeah. I hope that helps. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it just has to do with like doing the boring stuff. Like, unfortunately, you need to speak to people to hear like what they think about your product or yeah, what yeah. they want. So it's, it's inevitably you need to do demos, you know, so great stuff. So Jack, John is asking, I'm sending out 150 emails a day and get around 50 to 70 percent open rate with 3 percent reply rate. But I haven't signed a single client yet. Where can I improve? So I, I would say like those are great mer metrics to start off. Like where like what I mean, we don't know more details about like his funnel and or, you know, like and, and the landing page or the offer or anything else. But like, what do you think like should be some things that this person should look into? Yeah. So whenever the, when, uh, so I get asked this question a lot, like, how can I get more sales? Right. Of course. Cause that's what our business does. We help like agencies make more sales and it's always like, it depends on what's causing you to not get sales. So, um, basically you need to figure out what's causing you to lose deals. Right. Is it the sales call? Is it the show rate? It like what, so what, back to like, I think 10 minutes ago, we talked, you could rewind back to that part, Jack and, and rewatch it again, but just whatever those metrics we spoke about Roar, right new lead. So basically you're tracking open rate and reply rate. You got to track the rest of the process, right? Lead to appointment ratio, show rate, qualified percentage, qualified close percentage, right? Um, and if, if that sounds hectic to you, just, just at least start tracking your close rate. How many people that you met with that you offered your service to sign up, right? So you really got to start figuring out what it is, right? Um, and uh, we take our clients through like a sales process assessment where we have them like answer a couple of questions and then we tell them right away, like this is where you need to fix to lose to stop losing deals or to get more clients, right? It could be the lead to appointment. It could be the sales process. It could be the follow-up. It could be even the niche and offer to begin with, right? So hard to say without knowing more, but I would my recommendation would be start tracking your stats, at least the basics. Um, and again, like I'm happy to, yeah, share like a template for KPI tracking and whatever else I mentioned today, you guys can just message me on social media or I could share it with the, in the Facebook post after this. Um, yeah. But yeah, by the, for the love of God, just start tracking it because otherwise you're just kind of guessing. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, like like Felipe said, those are decent stats: fifty percent open rate, three percent yeah. reply rate. Yeah, um, those those are great. So I think I think like you know, like if we look at the funnel, like the the, the top of the funnel, it looks it looks solid. Yeah, so, so it's, it's just yeah. it's something probably breaking down in the rest of the funnel, right? So maybe yeah. they're not showing up, or like you know, it, it, if you've hopped on the phone with thirty of them and they none of them bought, then it could be your offer or it could be the sales process, right? Yeah. What I would make a, a goal, Jack, is uh, try to find out why you're not getting client like. Try to find out where you're losing out on clients, right? Yeah. Are they making it to the call? They're not signing up. And even if they are, why, right? So make it a goal. Like every time, by the way, guys, every time you don't get a client on a sales call, that's a good thing because you learn why. If you learn why, yeah. it's a good thing, right? So like, um, first of all, Jack, I mean, honestly, just by continuing to do what you're doing, you're going to get a client soon because those are good metrics, right? So just by continuing to do it, you'll, you'll get a client soon enough. Just keep at it. Um, but try to find try to find out what what's causing you to actually not sign clients, right? So, for example, if they're making it to the sales call and you're having lots of sales calls, they're not closing. Make it a goal that every time you leave a call, you find out why they didn't buy. Ask them questions. What didn't you like? Uh, what can I do better? You know, like whatever their objection is. Like most people, they say, "Oh, I want to think about it," and then they just hop off the call. Think about it is not an objection, right? You have to find out, like, okay, why do you want to think about it? Which part of this do you want to think over more, right? And then they'll tell you something more specific. So. Just make it a goal to find out why clients are not buying, and then you can then you can problem solve towards uh, towards that. But you have to know what you have to know what is you're dealing first. That's why I said that we always take our clients through like an assessment first because you got to like getting better at anything in life is a matter of knowing your current state. If I want to get better at like my health, I need to like go to the doctor, get some tests done, or I need to like you know look at like my current habits, like the gym, eating, right? So getting better at anything in life is first about really assessing like kind of where you are. Yeah, no, I agree with you, and and actually like. I feel like a lot of people, they think like just because someone replied with interest, it means that that's it. You know, I you send them an email and they will get back at me. But a lot of people, you know, like they're very busy like or they will forget about it or like maybe yeah. they're half convinced. So like, the work is still not done once they reply. So that 3% reply rate is good, but it doesn't mean like the, the, the whole like the, like the work is done. Like you will need to follow up with those people and, and bring them into the next part of your process, whatever your sales process is, whether it's like sending them something for free, where it is like sending them like a free like a loom video with an analysis or bringing mm. them into a demo so I, I like you need to like keep following on for example 
you know, this is part of like what we build based on the on, on people's feedback. Like, you know, at instantly we have a feature called sub sequences. And the reason why we build is sort of like to automate like the next uh emails based on like people's behavior. So yeah, i so anyways, the last questions. Um because uh, you know we really appreciate you having you here, AG. But obviously, we value your time a lot. So yeah, sure. Uh, been, it's been more than an hour. So, um, so next question: Is it recommended to include an unsubscribe link in your cold email campaigns, or is that being too spammy? What is the best practice? What do you got? What do you guys do as a revenue boost and or for your clients when it comes to unsubscribe links? Or yeah, yeah. So our ninja tip is uh, just put this word for word in your subject in your email body at the bottom. Just saying. Uh, hey, I might follow up again in a few days if I don't hear from you. Just let me know if you don't want me to email you again. What that does is you get more replies. So it helps your score, right? And then and rather than mark you with spam, they're just going to reply, right? And it sounds human because when you have when you have an unsubscribe link, it's like, oh shit, this is some automated thing, right? Um, yeah. So yeah, when you want to make you you do want to have an opt out. That's a guideline from Gmail. And if you're in the Europe too, like you have to. It's a GDPR thing. Um, so definitely have a way for them to opt out, but don't have it look automated. Just say like, Hey, just let me know if you don't want to hear from me again, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. No. Awesome. And Daniel is asking, my client has a Badger product and an no brainer offer. They help e-commerce uh, leverage their it's websites right. via email personalization recommendation and have an, and having say results, but I'm unable to get clients any idea. So what would you recommend to this person? Yeah, so it's really hard with that norm. It sounds like you're saying you're you have a client that offers this service to e-commerce and you want to help them get more e-commerce. If I'm hearing that correctly, it sounds like it. Um, yeah, but yeah, man. It's w w the best advice I can give you is like ask more specific questions to yourself and to other people. Because when you say like I'm I'm not able to get clients, what should I do? Like that's we're just gonna say like go back to the fundamentals: deliverability, copy, offer, targeting, right? So try to think of really specifically what's going wrong in the funnel and what is, you know, what metric is off. Right. Um, so yeah, it's always, you always want to really get specific on your situation. Cause you know, we do a lot of coaching and people always come to me with questions and I'm like, well, can you ask a more specific question? Cause then I can give you a better answer. Right. Um, so just some general ideas for you. If the, if the, if it's a banger product and a no brainer offer, show it to the prospect, don't tell them, right. Don't say we have this amazing software, just like give them a trial, give them an audit, give them a demo something. Right. Um, so if you really believe the the offer is great, you don't need crazy copy. You just need short copy that shows them why the offer is great. And maybe think of a lead magnet for them, like something they can do. Like uh, one of our clients has a SaaS tool and uh, we, you know, it, he books people onto a sales call, but we say on the sales call, we're going to help you audit your Google ad spend. So you're going to get a free audit of your, of your spend and tips on how to be more profitable. So think about the, think about the result of your client's software and promise that to people in the email and then try to give them some like free thing to help them get that. So that would be my tip. Yeah. Awesome. And the last question, Vincent is asking, how long will the call email be or how much content should the call email contain? So basically like when it comes to call email length and content, like what do you guys recommend or what do you guys preach or practice? Yeah. So, um, I, we, we have our, like we, our, the process that we teach for cold email copy, um, it's like 50 to 100 words, 120 max. There's not really a hard rule, but the, here's the thing. The longer your copy is, there's nothing wrong with long copy, but the longer your copy is, the more chances there are for someone to drop off, right? Which means it puts more pressure on you being this like a world-class copywriter. So unless you're like a world-class copywriter, don't do super long copy. So I hope that makes sense. That's really important. If you're, if you're a really, really good copywriter, you can make people engage through every sentence, right? And then you can get away with longer. But like, even still, why? Why put that pressure on yourself? Why not just make it simple and short? Because what happens is when an email is really, really long, and by the way, so like I mentioned before that we like, you know, teach our cold email and our add-on process to a lot of different agencies. And the biggest thing is this. I've reviewed like so many different cold emails and like LinkedIn scripts. And the biggest thing I see, it's always too long. I'm always like, hey, yeah. make it shorter, make it simpler. Yeah. Use Hemingway helps. Hemingway is a good app for that. Um, and yeah, like basically... That's the number one mistake I see. It's too long and it's too wordy. You could say the same thing in half the time and still make half the same the bullet points, right? So yeah, 50 to 100 words is pretty good. Um, but just realize like when an email is long, people skim. You don't want them to skim because when you write copy, you make it so that every word serves a purpose. So when you write copy, think about it like a journey that you're taking them through, right? Almost like a movie, right? Um, but if it's really long and boring, they're going to like skip past parts of the movie to see what's happening. You don't want them to do that, right? So um when it's really short like three five sentences 
they just kind of read it. They don't really skim it. And when you skim it, when someone skims your long message, they might be like, oh, sales pitch gone, right? Because they're busy. So yeah, when it's long, it just, it, I just don't recommend it. It's, it. I mean, I know some people, they do try long copy and it works. Um, I just, with cold emails, we just try to be really short and simple, 50 to 100 words. Yeah, no, I agree. Spot on, mic drop right there. So cool. AG, yeah, I, time there. <laughs> AG, I really appreciate your time and answering all of these questions. Guys, if you want to hear more about AG, he has also, um, what's your website, your socials? Like where can people hear more about yourself? Yeah, so if you want to connect with me, Facebook and LinkedIn is where I'm really active. Um, Instagram too, but I mostly am on like Facebook and LinkedIn. And it's just AJ Casada, the name here in the chat. Um, I also have a Facebook group, B2B Sales and Marketing Secrets. So I post a lot of stuff there too, like share a lot of results, like templates, copy, what's working for us. And it's a cool group there too. So, and we talk about sales and other stuff too, besides just cold email. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm active in the Facebook group. I'm active in uh, Facebook in general, LinkedIn. Our website is www.revenueboost.net. So we're revenueboost.net. We got some cool stuff there too. Um, but yeah, honestly, just to talk to me personally, best thing is uh, Facebook or LinkedIn. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, AJ, for all the tips, all the recommendations. And thank you guys for uh, tuning in today. Um, once again, my name is Felipe from the Instantly team. And uh, yeah, we wish you a happy early Thanksgiving, AJ, and like to everyone yeah. else in the US. So yeah. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Have one, guys.